Okay. And now we're recording. Okay, great. Okay, so yeah, quickly, let's just go around and say hi. There's only five of us as of right now. So um, just say hi, where you are, what you do, and then we'll start getting into the book. So my name is, is Dana. What you see on the screen, D. Surer. Surer is the last name. Uh, I'm an educator in Western New York, and uh, I'm a, a staff developer. And this position that I'm in is going to come to a close in about two weeks, and I'll have to rejoin the club with my new email address. I'm moving over to higher education, and I will be teaching at Buffalo State College. So wow, congrats. Here. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go next. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, my name is Mary, and I'm an English and education professor in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, Mary. Hi. Hi, I'll go next. I'm Sherry Hope Culver. I'm a professor at Temple University in Philadelphia and run the Center for Media and Information Literacy at Temple. Cool. Hi, Sherry. Hi. Okay, so I'll go next. I am Devina. I'm a PhD student in India, and my area of interest is young people in social media, which is why I'm all over Twitter. <laughs> and also our fantastic live tweet host. Yes, excellent. <laughs> Okay, and I'm Samantha. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Hong Kong, although I am in Rhode Island for the rest of the year doing visiting scholarship with URI. And as it turns out, I picked up a class this semester. I didn't plan to do that, but yay. <laughs> so I'll be teaching Americans for the first time and I'm so scared. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, let's get into the documentary, yes? Cool. Mm -hmm. So since there's only five of us, feel free to keep your microphone unmuted. Um, I don't know that there's going to be a need to um, do breakouts necessarily, but we'll see how we feel. But first, let's just um, talk a little bit about the documentary. So of course, it's a CNN documentary. Um, they, they referenced, um, you know, throughout, throughout the piece, they referenced their research that they did, and they, they kind of used the term research and study a couple of times. So um, We'll talk a little bit more about this, but it's unclear how rigorous this study was, and I couldn't really find a lot of information about it. But basically, you know, of course, the whole documentary goes through um, mostly like the challenges and dangers of, um, of teen social media use, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I picked out a couple of themes. Um, mostly they focused on um, popularity, sex, privacy and safety, addition to... Um, Addition to so social media, what does that mean? What do my notes mean? Uh, oh, addiction, not addition, sorry. Addiction and then parental involvement. Um, at one point, like for maybe a minute, halfway in, they mentioned some positive uses um, and that the positive uses overwhelm the negative, but they don't tend to focus on that, right? So um, that's it in a nutshell, I think. Uh, so my first question for you all is just what are your general thoughts? Do you think that, you know, just first impressions was what are, what are your first impressions? Davina? Yes. Hi. So um, the, the minute I opened the video, the first thing that hit me was, oh my God, these people are all about techno panics, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> because they keep on talking about the negative effects. They keep on talking about, oh, I casually look at my social media a hundred times a day. And oh my God, please don't judge. But I take maybe 200 selfies before I find the right one. And it's just trying to create this sense of paranoia among parents where they keep on talking about, oh my God, I can probably never get a handle on my children's social media. And also teens, you know, the ones that they interview, the ones that are there in the studio, they're constantly talking about the bullying and the sexting and all the negative aspects of social media. Whereas when you actually look at the report, which um, was, I think, as a footnote, they mentioned that this report is available for your perusal. If you look at that report, it's entirely different. It's talking about the positive aspects more. And I do agree with the tips that, um, uh, you know, um, Marin Underwood, yes, Marin Underwood gave. 
And one thing that really stuck with me was some of the children, it felt like they were giving a rehearsed speech. Because, you know, when you're talking about things like these, you, you tend to put in pillars like, um, you know, like, etc. And a lot of those young people did not have any fillers in the conversation. So that was interesting to me. Over to you guys. Yeah, I've been uh, the last couple of months, based on some of the other things that we've been reading or viewing, just even trying to pay attention to myself, but even adults. Like I was out at a restaurant with some friends and, and you know, I monitored myself and said, okay, I was like checking a couple times. The people I was sitting with, they all kind of actually checked more than I did because I, I was monitoring like in my head, I did it twice. And then I was viewing the other tables and I was like, I don't know, cracking up in a weird way, but not in a good way. Um, like there was a, families were out with their children and the kids weren't on their devices, but the parents were, there was a couple sitting across from each other and I, I actually was timing how long they were on their device versus talking to each other. I was like, I was just blown away. So it's not just kids. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so this is a, a, a new issue for the world and I feel like we will not be able to go backwards. We're going to need to go forwards mm -hmm. and figure out a way to juggle and balance all of this. I do agree with Davina that there was a, um, a leaning towards the downside of using social media. Something that occurred to me is this study was done here in the United States. I'm wondering if similar studies have taken place elsewhere because it would be interesting from my perspective to do some comparison culturally what's happening in different parts of the world. Yeah, Davina. Um, I have a response to what Mary asked. We do have EU Kids Online um, headed by Professor Sonia Livingston and that sort of has culminated into a larger project called Global Kids Online and essentially they are talking about how the world of social media is just like the real world. You have opportunities, you have risks and you're navigating through those um, just like you would in, in the real world. So I think Global Kids Online is, um, so yes, LSE, uh, sorry, London School of Economics uh, with Professor Sonia Livingston is heading that, but you also have, they've also partnered with UNICEF and HMP, so the research wing. Uh, and I think it's currently in 13 or 14 countries and it just came to India. <laughs> Could you um, write the names of those studies down? Um, in the chat box, that would be super helpful. Yes. Oh, did, so I just yes. put the link there, and Davina, it auto corrected your name. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're <laughs> you're now deviant. <laughs> um, Sherry, what are your thoughts? Sorry, I was leaving it on mute. So I I will tell you that I I have. I'll give you some thoughts about this in general, but I have not watched the documentary yet. I was really curious how the how you were doing these chats, and I'd been hearing about them for a while, and I wanted to really join. I had no idea how many people were, were going to be on, and I really thought, well, I'll just be able to sort of sit in the background and listen. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot harder to do when it's only five, and I'm only able to be on for like 15 minutes, so I apologize in advance. Sure. Uh, I will join these things in the future, and I, 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 I teach a course at that's media and children. So I really wanted to watch the doc to consider using it in my classes. But the point about adults is, I mean, I 100% agree on that. I, that's, I mean, we know that that's where kids are learning their habits from, right? They're, right. They may be watching things from their friends, but, the, but parents are the most influential people in their lives. And the, the only other counter I'll do to that is, um, you know, I have, my husband and I worked in the television business for a very long time and now we both are professors and I have an 18 year old daughter. Sometimes we go out to dinner and we're sitting at the table and we're all on our phones but we're talking and sharing and looking at things and sending things to each other and I say to them I'll bet if somebody looked at our table right now they would think what a shame they're not even communicating mm -hmm. but actually we are and yeah. so I, I do uh, try to withhold judgment about what is actually happening at the table because you don't really know. Now, sometimes you see people at a meal or out or whatever and, and they're like completely buried in their devices. <laughs> that we can probably make an assumption yeah, about. Yeah, but sometimes yeah, yeah. it's hard to tell what people are really doing. Right. And we don't know what the story is. We don't know what the family situation yeah. is. 
a whole lot of reasons why that's what's happening in that moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's a great point. And I think that's actually a lot of the context that was missing around this documentary too, because there was such a focus on, you know, the, the dangers and, you know, like you guys were saying, there, there really wasn't much of an exploration at all of, of how um, these, like, you know, access to different communities and different people online is actually enhancing the lives of teens. And if you look at the, some of the responses to the video in the comments, I would actually uh, love to see what the comments were directly to the original um, CNN I don't think CNN put it on YouTube, but anyway. Um, teenagers themselves were actually saying in the comments, like, hey, you know, I do use social media a lot and I don't really see this, or I do see this, but I also, this isn't a, like a major part of my environment online. Mm -hmm. So I think like there's actually, this documentary to me, I think does a bit of a disservice to parents because it is very much like a fear mongering kind of a thing. Um, and it, yeah, like it, it's, um, it's kind of sad actually that parents don't also get to understand the, the positive benefits from this documentary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. So did we learn anything from this documentary? Was there anything that surprised you? And keep in mind, like one, I think um, someone said something about like diversity, right? Like, like globally, this is probably not how te most teenagers use um, social media or it could be, we, we don't know. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the kids in the video, like all of the kids interviewed in person were from one single area. Um, we don't really know the full distri distribution of the kids across the US. Um, it was limited to 200 student or 200 kids. So um, I don't know, with that in mind, like did anything surprise you? Did, did you learn anything? Do you think there any, was any valuable information? Well, the, the negative things that were presented in the documentary, I think, are important to be aware of. Um, you're right about the location. It seemed to be all the Southeast U.S., um, mm -hmm. as far as I could tell. And I, I don't know, like you said, whether that means someone in, say, Washington State might behave differently. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the negative things are useful to know about. Mm -hmm. I mean, at, at times, it, you know, you've felt that um, not like a docudrama, but kind of a little bit that it's this documentary, but where is it really grounded in something a little more substantial or robust enough? And this was from 2015, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, part of me says, okay, well, now we're, you know, 2019, soon to be 2020. Where has this gone from that juncture? Where, where even just with CNN and their researchers, uh, where is the follow up, or even the follow up with, say, even the people that were the, the uh, students that were in this documentary? Where are they now with that? You know, um, so I felt uh, again, I would want to do maybe some follow up work myself to one find, like you said, the research that it was based on. What is some newer research or uh, researchers around this work? And right, we need balance. It can't always just be negative. There has to be a flip side of the story as well. Yeah, and I, I kind of consider myself a protectionist when it comes to media mm -hmm. literacy, but even for me, this, this felt very heavy handed. Um, so yeah, I agree with you. I think um, I also, because, so I grew up in Northern Virginia and a lot of these kids and all of them who were videoed were from Virginia and I could I can kind of tell like knowing the landscape of Virginia these kids were definitely from Northern Virginia mm -hmm. and the the environment that like of bullying and stuff that they were describing is exactly what I experienced being 13 in Northern Virginia and so mm -hmm. I know that it's a very cultural thing it's it's rooted culturally not just online but offline and that's just kind of where it's gone because that's where communication has gone, right? So I wasn't really surprised to hear like sort of the ways that social media was being weaponized for bullying. Um, but I was surprised that, that the documentary made it seem so surprising, right? Like it's not really a, like bullying is not a new phenomenon. We know this, right? But we do know that social media has exposed maybe a scale 
um, mm -hmm. or maybe increased to scale. Yeah, I don't know. Or made it visible. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think it makes it visible and there's a record of it. That's the thing that's the issue around. So I didn't, I did not realize that it was from 2015. I mean, I agree with the point that 2015 to 2019, almost 20 in media, in media years <laughs> is a big leap. And that um, I, I, it, I think it's one of the dangers that we run into is that everything is so accessible forever that it's very easy to go online and pull something without ever really thinking about what year it's from. And I actually see that a lot on, I've noticed it quite a bit on John Oliver, looking at um, uh, Last Week Tonight on HBO and, and the way points are made, right? So points are made by pulling pieces from uh, video from different areas, but those video pieces may be, are not necessarily from the last year. They're from mm -hmm. the last 10 years. And, mm -hmm. and so our, and not that there aren't dangers, there definitely are, and there are things you have to be aware of, but the, but the way we think about those things and the way we've been handling them, hopefully we've been learning things and getting a little bit better. And those earlier pieces don't necessarily reflect that. So it's yeah. dangerous there, but the, but the maybe a little more, um, not just balance, but just sort of our insights about what, where the dangers really are, how to start dealing with them, where the concerns really need to lie, where how do we model the best good behavior? Like mm -hmm. those things we're learning more and more each year and they're not necessarily reflected in things that are even a few years older. Yeah. 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 Um, and to that same point, I also wondered like if this was a two year study, like thinking back around what social media looked like at that time and how it was evolving, mm -hmm. kids probably started or stopped using some platform during that two years, right? Like I think chat, Snapchat came along sometime, sometime between mm -hmm. that time period. So even just 2014. like 2000, exactly. So yeah, like the way that um, kids are using technology and the technology availability itself changed so much during that time that, you know, that's something that probably also should have been addressed. And I wonder if the, I mean, Davina, you read the report, did it talk any about that at all? Like changing platforms or anything like that? So it largely talked about um, how parents need to navigate through children's social media, how they need to start um, monitoring their use, but also start listening to their children and also start um, helping them out. Like, oh, you know, for instance, the example that you gave, that Northern Virginia has a lot of bullying that happens on a regular basis. It's just something that is now being... Um, has now been evidenced in social media as well. So if you um, were an older sibling or if you were a parent in that milieu, what would you do? Essentially, we were trying to tell parents that that's exactly what you need to do even with your children's social media. Um, but I haven't been able to look at the report in that much detail, but I can put it down here for you. Yeah, that would be awesome. I looked very briefly for it and I couldn't really, I found like another page with some like text on page, but I didn't find a link to the report, um, but I didn't look super, super hard for it. So that would be awesome. Thank you. Please, I'm going to jump off and I apologize for leaving, but I will, I'm going to go back and read and watch this <laughs> after and follow you that way and hopefully join in future months. So I, I, yeah. If you don't get time, if you don't get time to watch the full documentary, I've just put a few links here on the Zoom group chat. You can look at those. Okay, great. Yeah, thank thanks you. for joining us, Sherry. Bye. 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 Um, go sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead, Mary. I was thinking about in that discussion of it being um, made four years ago is also about the phone use in schools and whether. Four years ago, that was one way, and four years later, it's another way. I, I tend to wonder what's allowed in schools and whether kids are, you know, are they leaving the classroom to, to be online or what's going on in schools? I'm not in this school, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's just something, a question I have. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I've been out of the classroom. Um, most 10 years now so I work with adults so I'm not in the classroom setting if I wouldn't be able to speak speak to it either I just know from the, uh, the courses that I teach in higher ed 
you know, I have a couple of students that they have their cell phone right in their lap. And my policy is, you know, use, you know, be courteous, right? Digital etiquette, you're in the middle of class, maybe there is an emergency going on, okay. But then you probably should maybe excuse yourself then if you really need to be following up on something. Uh, some of my colleagues, they are, you know, no cell phones, no digital de devices. And part of my world's like, well, it could be serviceable for something, you know. So uh, I try to have a delicate balance in my own classroom. Um, and just hopefully that my students, you know, respect it and understand what digital etiquette is, knowing that, you know, you're going to be future educators. You won't, wouldn't want your students to be on their cell phone during the whole class, right? So, mm -hmm. so I, I kind of trying to practice what hopefully you would want someone to do in real life. Right. I wonder how much, so thinking about, you know, this issue of, of you know, phones in the classroom, um, I agree with you, Dana. I think that there definitely should be a balance, right? Like you can't keep kids offline. And there are so many resources that we can be taking advantage of as educators that are online that it's a shame to just mm -hmm. limit yourself to paper, right? Or <laughs> talking. Um, so I guess I, I wonder if there's, of course, we all know that there's, um, a deficit in digital literacy amongst adults and educators, right? But in mm -hmm. addition to that, I wonder if we need to start focusing also on how do we teach educators to be more engaging with mm -hmm. students to keep their attention to, mm -hmm. I mean, I know that some um, curricula for educators do, do does address this, but um, like how, how can we foster that more so that we're not, we're competing with like, you know, engagement and not just rules. Right. It, it, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a struggle. It's a, it, working with educators and just a sense of student engagement. It's like, to be honest, I, I, like when I'm leading sessions and my colleagues who lead sessions that are in the other disciplines, like math, science, and um, English language arts, it's we, we want to stab our eyes out at times because we're working with a, a, also adults to say what part aren't you understanding your students don't want to listen to you for like 30 or 40 minutes you need to let the kids be doing the talking with each other like like i don't know it's <laughs> something i'm working toward <laughs> thoughts from uh mary davina I was just thinking about the, the kind of push and pull tug of war between social life and learning that must be going on in mm -hmm. the minds of students. And mm -hmm. I don't know where to go with it. That's just something I'm thinking about. Yeah. 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 So I like how um, we sort of shifted the lens from the students to the people who are trying to educate the students. And um, I think it's really important that we become um, sort of self-aware about what we take for granted. So we take our television screens and our overhead projectors and our digital projectors for granted. We mm -hmm. take our PowerPoints for granted. We take our uh, lecture methods for granted. But you have Google Classrooms today. You have online uh, quiz apps today, which you could integrate in your pedagogy, in your methods to teach, which could end up actually engaging students more than, um, I don't know, distracting them. We have this sense of whatever's on our smartphones is meant for, um, you know, just flighty connection or uh, entertainment or distraction. But maybe we could just spin it around and make it something that's more engaging, right? Mm -hmm. So for instance, uh, I, I had a brief stint as uh, assistant professor in a business school uh, back home before I started my PhD program. And uh, while I used to take attendance, my students would love taking these, putting on these Snapchat filters and taking snaps of me. And we used to end up having a great laugh about it together later. Mm -hmm. And there was this other example that I saw online. If I, if I find the link, I'll post it. But this amazing uh, woman, she uh, asked her students to make memes. 
mm-hmm. throughout the class. So whatever stands out to them in the class, uh, at the end of the class, the last day, she reserved half an hour so that people could present their memes. And they were just amazing. They were hilarious. Sometimes they were, I mean, really insightful. And I think it's a great way to engage students, isn't it? I mean, right. you end up paying attention because you've got to make that meme, yeah, right? That's right. You're doing some synthesis there. You're doing some thinking of which image or how you're going to use it to make the connection. And that's, you know, I'm a, I believe I'm, for the most part, a constructivist. Like, if someone's just talking to me the whole time, how am I even making any sense of it or making meaning? I need to, I need to talk to somebody about it. Or I have to create something. I need to write myself a note. I have to make it connect. It's kind of like when you're baking cookies, if you're a baker, if you just have your flour and your sugar and all your dry ingredients, nothing's going to stick, right? You need an egg or milk or a little bit of water to make it connect. And I believe for whatever reason, at least at the secondary level, trying to do things that help kids make the connection is not there. Just because I spewed out whatever about Napoleon and watched a video for 10 minutes and did a PowerPoint for 10 minutes and did a crossword puzzle on vocabulary, don't mean my kids know anything about Napoleon, right? Because no one's talked about it or wrote about it or, or spoke about it. It was just, you know, so that's what has, you know, has my, you know, wheels turning in my head. Um, like, how do we help kids in the learning of it and not just well, I sat in the class for 40 minutes. Which might have nothing to do with social media, but again, <laughs> how, how, how can we make connections um, and yeah. allow kids to express themselves that way or, or um, do something that's going to help them make their connection because the way maybe I might connect might be different from students of today. So. Yeah. And I think this all go, it, it really goes back again to this like reinforcement of digital literacy for educators, because I can definitely see an educator being like, oh yeah, you know, kids should know about social media. Like we should teach them digital to be digital literate, but not really know how to do that. And so rely on something like this. Like I even saw in the comments of the video that like one kid was like, oh yeah, we watched this in class. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Like I bet that educator probably wanted to talk about this in class, but didn't really know how to, and was just like, oh, this is great. I'm just going to show this, and then they'll be prepared, right? right. But I don't, think, <laughs> I don't think that, you know, that's necessarily the right way to go, right? So, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would you guys use this or part of this in the classroom? I'm thinking about it, um, but again, having like those counter arguments, especially being a history social studies person, being able to present that, and and part of me almost would like to present the counter argument first before showing the CNN video. I don't know, just kind of doing in the opposite direction. So, uh, and then the, the Facebook documentary as well, maybe components of that, and just, uh, you know, the students I'll be starting the fall with are the new cohort of kids, like, like they're kids to me, right? Um, now I'm super old. Uh, but there are future classroom teachers and they're 20 or 21 and they have a year left prior to them being in their student teaching and maybe two years away from being in a, in a school district. So when I add it up, they're only a couple, they're at most four years away from being in high school themselves. So what was it like for them four years ago? What are they bringing to the table in their future classrooms that they'll be instructing? So, so that's what has my wheels going. And, and I, I, I guess the other piece, when I was watching the CNN documentary and thinking about this, I was wondering how to be sensitive to potentially the students in my classroom if they really resonated with one of those students, right? Because what if they were a victim of being a bully, right? Or maybe they were the bully and they're self-reflecting. So I, I want to be sensitive to that because they really aren't that far away from maybe really being 13, to be honest. So, so I sort of, um, so I'm, I'm still in my 20s, right? So mm-hmm. I sort of thought of me bringing something to the table for my students because I was not that long ago on the other side of the table. 
Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you, when you were talking about, you know, uh, asking them to reflect on, oh, you were in high school not four years ago, and mm-hmm. what was your experience like? So I sort of, I, I think people might actually end up thinking that way, and you're absolutely right, because that's what I did. And uh, which is why I guess it was cool for me that they were snapping. It wasn't really cool for everybody in the faculty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that was interesting, and I also, I mean, going back to what um, you know, Sherry was talking about, I think that was really interesting. Where you know we have these uh, judge, judgmental lenses uh, around us, you know, where we constantly want to talk about, oh, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong, or uh, oh my God, you spent so many hours on the on the smartphone or on social media. But I guess that's what we're doing, right? We we probably spending the entire workday in front of a screen. That's mm-hmm. a laptop screen. If mm-hmm. you're traveling, you're probably spending a lot of time on our phones. Mm-hmm. And I guess it's just the new normal. I mean, why is it so difficult to wrap our minds around the fact that we live with our laptops and our mobile phones? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I I agree, and I think again the important thing is that is learning going forward how to strike a balance, how mm-hmm. how to like I said earlier we can't go backwards. So how will we go forwards in a productive and healthy way? Is mm-hmm. more the question, I think. Mm-hmm. So I think also the the importance of that balance. There was one moment in the documentary where like my jaw kind of dropped, and I it wasn't super surprising, but I it was it hurt my heart to hear it. Um, one of the kids said something about like when I I, I want to just say something online and not like not deal with conflict face to face. I don't want to deal with human emotion. I can't yeah. deal with human emotion and conflict. And I was just like, oh my God, like, okay, it's good that she recognizes that, but it doesn't seem as though she recognizes the, how dangerous that is actually. <laughs> um, and that is something I think that we, as we're, as we're teaching both the positive and negatives of online communication, there has to be a corresponding element of, you know, the fact that we're still communicating with humans. And I don't know how to do that. Is there, do we need to force conflicts that, like, you know, face-to-face conflict somehow to get students to be more comfortable with it. Like, how do we do that? And where is, like, where is the training for us as educators to learn how to do that, right? Like, I don't know. So, um, you know, I think we forget the fact that these guys are teenagers and they have so much going on, and I think even the littlest of things, which we consider the littlest of things, not they, are like these really major crises that they are in. And um, I guess even without social media, I'm sure that there'll be, like, I, I used to, and I sometimes still feel that a non-confrontational approach is the best. And maybe I should just, you know, let it tie out and it'll sort itself out on its own. So right. I'm not sure. I think I think what Mary said, you know, I think that makes sense. That social media just kind of evidences everything. It sort of becomes like the megaphone. It sort of magnifies everything. I think all of these things existed before social media, social media as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're, I agree with that. Go ahead, Mary. Yeah, that's all I, I wanted to just say. It amplifies. Yeah, go yes, ahead. amplifies. Good yeah. word. Good word, amplify. I can write that one down. So did you guys read, um, what is the Douglas Rushkoff book that we read last year? You're thinking fast, thinking slow. No, that's Daniel Kahneman. Um, gosh, what was it? Program or Reprogrammed? Yes. So in that book, he talked a lot about this phenomenon in adults as well and how on, you know, advances in, you know, technology and online communication is making adults start to fear conflict or to communicate in this way as well, where they say whatever they want to online and don't feel consequence. And in mm-hmm. real life, they would never say something like that face to face to a person. It's mm-hmm. kind of like the same as like in a car, you would like say, say things to people that you would never say if you were like walking on the street past them, right? <laughs> so um, it is a human, it is a human phenomenon, right? And I think it, it varies by culture for sure. Um, but like that ability to just 
I mean, I think you're right, Davina, not everything has to be like, you don't have to address every conflict, but to be able to, um, if you're, if, if, have the if, ability to, if necessary, if you're going to manifest a feeling, make it a healthy way instead of like, you know, behind someone's back or in a way that is not actually productive and is actually harmful. So I, yeah, I agree. Like you don't have to like address every little thing that bothers you or like, you know, every single conflict, but to the extent that you do act on it, how can we make that healthier? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. instead of letting it amplify online because in reality right we've all been in the workplace a number of years or even just our, our college courses or, or our master's program or our doctorate program we're going to come in contact with people in our schooling or our working or even just you know going to the store and ha having to work with a sales clerk or a service person on this on the phone right you need to call them for a repair in your house like you need to be able to communicate an expression and not get like, oh my gosh, so upset or mad about it. You're going to work with colleagues where you're thinking, oh my gosh, like I wish that wish that person would be quiet or or would handle things differently. So how, what are we doing? You know, with that social emotional learning to a certain degree, helping kids be able to work through a constructive struggle or conflict. Because guess what, folks, we're going to have them. It's going on right now, right? It's what are we going to do? Makes me oh. think of efforts towards civil conversations and yes. conflict resolution. And it's almost as though that, I mean, listening to you, I am starting to think maybe that's a, a really viable path for this to, mm -hmm. to kind of go under what's happening mm -hmm. online and what's, mm -hmm. the, what's the foundation behind it. Yeah, yeah. That's a good yeah. point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of what we, so I, I hadn't really, well, I hadn't studied digital education at all before, you know, last year's um, summer institute at, at the University of Rhode Island. But one thing that struck me was the focus on self-reflection. And I think that's a really good start, right? Like reflecting on yourself, like, what am I learning? What am I thinking? How do I feel about this? But I think we also, not but, and I think we also need to take that one step further and incorporate exactly what you guys just said, like that emotional yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm gonna i'm gonna post two uh texts that i that i've been using and i'm gonna be using um in a more formal way this this school year it's diane hess uh she's a social studies guru and spends her her work around how do you have uh, controversial conversations with students in a history or a social studies classroom uh, and really kind of speaks to the sense of public discourse in her research. The one text is a little bit dated now. Um, she has a new one that's um, either out or it's coming out. And then there's another fella um, that crossed my path uh, with some other colleagues. His name is Matthew Kay. And he, in the title of his book, he quotes uh, Frederick Douglass. And he speaks to the quote, uh, not, not light, but fire your students with the sense of being able to have uh, racial conversations. Uh, so and the different acts of being able to practice that. And just like anything, if, you, if we don't help our students practice civil and civic discourse, what would make you think that they can do that once they leave, right? If it's not happening at yeah. home. And one of our presenters talked about, um, she's sometimes invited to go and speak at the local high school football game or baseball game to be like that motivational speaker. And she speaks about, uh, her work is really around mindfulness, but it really resonated with me in the sense of how will students be able to have civic and civil discourse. And what she said to the coach, she's like, yeah, I'll come be your pep talk before the game uh, about mindfulness but did your players just learn how to throw the ball tonight as well? Cause like, if, you know, if you're just having me speak for five minutes or 10 minutes before the baseball game on how to be mindful, I don't know, do they just practice and learn how to throw a ball in the last five or 10 minutes? Cause it's not gonna happen, you know? So again, it makes, it really resonated mm -hmm. the sense that if we're not practicing it, what would make me expect that kids can do it or even adults can do it, right? 
But I'm yeah. gonna, because I'm gonna be typing away, so I'm gonna go on mute so you don't hear me typing. Yeah, that's great. I'm really excited to see those talks. But I think, yeah, you, you nailed it. Like these are things like we, we need students to be training themselves to think this way automatically. And because it feels overwhelming when you have to constantly think like, okay, now I'm gonna analyze the shit out of this piece of writing, you know? Like it's exhausting and it really intimidates students. And the whole point is to like get them to do it automatically. And so you're right, like practice and like attention to those thoughts and feelings are like something that they do have to, to just practice, yeah. So, um, sorry. I just wanted to ask um, which professor's work Dana was talking about. What's the name of the professor? Oh, Dana, you're muted. Diane Hess. It's uh, Diane Hess. I'm posting it right now on the chat board. Okay, that's great. Because I know another person who's um, who also talks about uh, racism and Islamophobia and things like that. She also is in the media literacy circles. Um, mm -hmm. Shrivi Ramasubramaniam, I think she's with Texas A&M University. Uh, can you put that in the chat box too? Yes. Her name? Mm -hmm. Mary, did you want to add some thoughts? Yeah, so I was just reflecting on what Dana had said. And I think that if we're looking at um, this, back to this documentary of what habits and practices kids are using at age 13, it strikes me that it has to start way earlier. So this kind of education needs to start from the get-go. It can't, you can't wait till they're 13 years old and say, oh my goodness, what are you doing online? Let's solve this. It has to, those foundational skills need to be would put way back in their education. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what the challenge is because like parents introduce or allow their student or their kids to um, adopt technology at very different rates, right? And I wonder what kind of challenge that presents to educators when we start talking about like how early can and should this start? Like I'm thinking about like my, like my niece, I think got a smartphone when she was like, I don't know, six or seven, but then like, all, you know, and it, it, it only had Wi-Fi and then suddenly she had like a full, you know, a, an iPad. And like, I know a lot of um, my other friends are like, no, they can have one hour of screen time, one, you know, one day a week or whatever. And it just varies so much that like, how do you, how can you address that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe those social and emotional and mindfulness lessons are what start first. Mm -hmm. And then sort of gradually weave in the digital learning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe that's the way to. And then by the time they're 13, just make the assumption that they've all got it. Yeah, yeah. It's probably the very rare. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm guessing here, but it seems like it would be rare by middle school age that kids wouldn't have online access. Right, right, right. Because then, then they're going to be you know, excluded from what their peers are going through, you know, and that we know being a part of the group is super important to, to, to those preteen teenage years. So. But it is, um, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no go ahead. I, I'm okay, go ahead. Uh, again, just, I think watching the documentary and just some of the other pieces we've done the last couple months, even though I haven't been able to join the, the, the group, it, it just has me really thinking like, what would it be like to be back in the classroom with, you know, teenagers again? Because I work with young adults. So, so I'm just reflecting of what maybe their experiences were and just, uh, and then I, I counter the other thought is sometimes as adults, I think sometimes we do make a big deal out of things that that's really not a big deal. Like for the kids, like it happened. And then for I think most kids, maybe not all, but I think for most kids, they move on. And it, it just has me reflecting back. I have some friends with young children. They're starting to come to age for the sex education talk, you know, and the parents are like, you know, and I think they're youthful parents and like they're getting all like squirmish, like how do I do this talk? And I just think back to what my mom used to share with my sister and brother. I have no children, but when, when their kids are going through it, she basically said, just don't say too much. Whatever your, your child asks of you, try to answer the question in the, the, 
the littlest amount of words you can. And, you know, keep it short. Because if they don't say any much further, then whatever you said, they're okay with, you right? Because sometimes, you know, we get into full-blown details and we go beyond and on and we, we already lost them. You know what I mean? So, she, uh, so it always kind of resonated with me now that my younger friends are kind of going through what my siblings went through. And just sometimes we as adults, we need to be the mindful ones, right? Because we're the adult. Like stay calm, maybe just a little bit. You don't have to do all of it. And then wait for what's being asked of us. So I've been trying to pair that now as an educator. How do I do that with social media and digital literacy and civic controversy. So that's my thought on that. <laughs> I guess maybe if um, young people can feel like they can talk to you and you listen and not judge and they can share things with you without consequence, maybe mm -hmm. that's a start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So and it comes back to tr trust, respect. Yeah. I think that's a great point, Davina. Like that's um, uh, something that was a, I think one of the biggest takeaways from the documentary as far as like the parental advice section, like to be there for your children and to like have conversations with them about their day and about what they're experiencing online. And I wonder, like they kind of presented like, you know, you should be following your kids on social media. You should be your friends, your, your kids' Facebook friends. And it kind of, it felt more like a, you should be, you know, hovering and watching. But I think it could have, they could have gone parenting. farther. Yeah, exactly. Like, don't be a helicopter. Be like a, you know, I don't know, like a, I don't know, something that actually interacts with things, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know what machinery that would be. But mm -hmm. like, actually you know, if they're having conversations online, shouldn't we be having conversations online with them, right? And, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that, you, you know, you can't talk at the dinner table also, but, mm -hmm. you know, like showing them that, you know, like modeling that behavior for them online and actually being a part of it instead of a spectator. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Which again, it's really hard too, because like most parents are not super digital literate or they are in their own world, right? Like they're mm -hmm. using Facebook in their own way, mm -hmm. um, which is very different to how kids are using social media too, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but even like going back to this whole like bullying thing and like, I remember like, so like I was bullied a bit when I was in school and I like just recently in the last couple of years, like my mom had said something about bullying and I was like, well, t I was bullied when I was a kid. And she was like, you were. And I was like, you didn't know that. Like as, an, as adults now, like we're having this conversation where I thought it was obvious. Right. And like, she had no idea until like two years ago and I'm 37, you know? So it's, it's hard to have those conversations. Right. And like, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think it's, it's a broader, it's a broader conversation. So we've like pulled in this emotional stuff and, you know, mm -hmm. I think those are all really important to you. No, but you know, before you shared that anecdote, that's exactly what I was thinking about, you know, do you as parents or teachers need to know every single detail about your children's lives or, or your students' lives? I mean, you know, sometimes it's all right to not know everything that they're going through and just maybe know this much that if they need you, you're there for them and they know that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess, so for instance, if something happened with me and I had that opportunity to speak with my mother or father or my supervisor, I think knowing that I can approach them solves a big, big problem. If I know that I have someone to talk to, I think that's like a big support. And flipping it to teachers or parents, I don't think they, the lack of knowledge of something that's happened to their kids makes them any, any better or worse parents or teachers, right? I mean, it's not something that you can control. Similarly, on social media, it's not something that you can monitor 24-7. I mean, that would be a full-time job in itself. So 
it sounds like communication channels need to be open. That's what it sounds like. Like that's a, a good solution to establish that. Maybe as um, for parents, but also for educators. This conversation is really highlighting for me how important it is to bring in like other disciplines to our literacy teaching, right? Like it's not just enough to learn the tools, but yeah. to understand like psychologically and socially how we're using them and how it affects us as people and as communities. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. 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 I, I just dropped in the New York State social emotional learning homepage. Um, there's a lot on that page. Uh, they have one document, it's a little bit further down, and they call it the benchmarks. Um, and it is, it's newer in New York State, and my fear is that teachers are just going to see it as another initiative or another like, add on to their plate. But just reading it, it's like, okay, this like, this kind of like makes sense, right? It's a part of our, um, should be a part of our pedagogy, or, or should be a little bit of like why we got into education to begin with or at least a component of it. Um, but yeah, so if you're interested, I think some of the conversation we're having today, it, it connects, right? Because we just, we just don't learn in this vacuum. We all bring different experiences and emotions and habits or ways of thinking to the table. And, you know, unfortunately, I think sometimes that, that gets lost during the process of schooling. So a um, new semester just begun here as well in the University of Hyderabad. And uh, my supervisor teaches um, masters in communication students uh, who just joined this course called Basics in uh, Writing, Basics of Writing. And uh, I was just casually chatting her up and I was like, this is a central university. So the fees is really low because the government subsidizes education here. There's, public funding for public education. So you will have people who will come from remote villages. You will also have people who come from uh, suburbs, you know, around the city. So they uh, are clued into the hip popular culture of the city, but not so much. And there also be people from the city. And uh, I was just asking her, you know, how are you going to do this? Because you will have different levels of uh, education of, um, you know, upbringing of culture of that nuance of writing and the language, right? So this is a central university. So everything is in English. Someone might be an amazing writer in their vernacular. But what about, uh, you know, translating that skill into English? And she just said that it's, it's a journey that people will take. And there'll be this 20% who will really benefit uh, because they have, um, you know, that drive to learn and uh, this will be like the opening of uh, a new window, like the pearl shining and coming out of the oyster shell <laughs> uh, because they're really interested and they're driven and they probably have those skills in a different language to begin with. And then there'll be this other 20% who's really good at what, they, what they're doing already. And this skills, you know, um, skills course is just like an add-on to their already rather developed repertoire. But the rest of the 60% is just going to be tied by the course. And if you sit down and bother about every single student, it probably might not be such a good idea for your health and for your <laughs> mental right. strength. Right, right, right. Hmm. So, I don't know, maybe I, I'm not sure if it exactly fit into the conversation, but I thought it was pertinent to bring this up. Yeah. No, I think I, 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 you're right, right? We, there's a, a, a realm in all our schools of social economic, uh, makes for different types of people. And, you know, sometimes not that it doesn't have to be good or bad. It's just like, this is where I'm from. But to what degree, um, regardless of where you're from or, or your, your race, your religion, your sexual orientation, like how do we in our classrooms today be accepting of it and, 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 and not just tolerate it, right? Because there's a difference from tolerance and acceptance. Just this is who you are and 
And it's okay. We just need more of that in our world. Right. That sounds um, like an excellent point to <laughs> end on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so a couple of things. First, I want to actually, I just noticed that we have another, um, another member on with us, Salome. Salome? Well, hello. I don't know if you could hear us or... <laughs> uh, Please say hi. I just followed you back on Twitter. Are you there? Hey. Hello? Okay. No, okay. Um, well, hopefully, um, hopefully you all can join next month. So I wanted to get a quick, um, a quick uh, sense of our next meeting is technically scheduled for September 12th, which is Labor Day in the US. And I know a lot of people might be on vacation. Um, yeah. What do you, do you guys think you could join on the second? Should I reschedule it? Should we maybe skip September? Cause I know we're all getting ready to like go into the new semester in September. Yeah. Like, I wonder if there's been a text that keeps on getting pushed on the back burner. So if we don't meet in September, it would actually give us like two months to kind of dive into that. Yeah. That we have a lot of craziness in our schedules. Yeah. Um, so maybe. I'll just put that idea out there. So maybe go for a book next time, but make it a two month read. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Davina? I think that sounds like a great idea, but do, um, is that book available online or will it be available in India easily? Because we sometimes have that issue. Yeah. Um, so, so normally what we do is vote on a title. I give us, the, I give a, the choice of an audio, video, and book title. Um, so I, I hesitate to kind of deviate from that because I want it to be sort of democratic. Mm -hmm. um, however, if you know, our participation kind of varies greatly from month to month. So um, let's see what I have lined up. Uh, so the choices this time around are a TEDx talk about how cameras are changing the world. Um, the Team Human podcast with Douglas Rushkoff about um, how oligarchies um, influence operating systems. And then um, the book is Irresistible, The Rise of Addictive Technology and the Business of Keeping Us Hooked by Adam Altler. So I know, Davina, that that is available um, in an online format. However, whether or not like, it is available for free or of no cost is a question. Um, yeah, so at, like all of the books that we choose are available on Amazon and Google usually, but, um, and actually sometimes we do, uh, I don't know, sometimes those things are available through other means, <laughs> like libraries, right? <laughs> so, yeah, online libraries. Yeah. Yes, online libraries. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so with that, why don't we, so why don't we go ahead, why don't we keep the voting process as it is, mm -hmm. and I'll suggest, like, we have two months, so mm -hmm. that people, if they, if everyone wants to decide that we want to do a book, they can keep that in mind when they're mm -hmm. voting this time around. Does that yeah. sound good? Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you guys so much. Davina, thank you so much for, like, um, hosting the Twitter chat. Like, I, I'm amazed by your attention span that you can be so present in this conversation and also be so present on Twitter. Like, that's amazing. I don't even know how you do it. Um, okay, thank you to you all, and I hope to see you uh, next month or in October. All right. And then Samantha, I know you're Samantha. I wasn't thinking earlier, but I will send you my new email. I'm going to do that when okay. I log off. All right. Perfect. Thanks, all Dana. Right. Bye, everyone. Video. Bye. Thank you, Sam. A lovely Bye. home. Bye. Bye, Mary. Bye. Thanks.